Why do you say that, Father? You aren't afraid, are you? No. But I respect some of the superstitions of others. Often they are founded in fact. Broadcasting live from our Sanctum Sanctorum in Venice, California. This is the Sixth Sense Society. I'm your host, Krista, here with our producer, Michael. And today we're excited to have on the show for the first time, uh, Anwen Avalon. She is a water witch, water priestess, and founder of Truskelly Rose Witchcraft, an Avalonium witchcraft tradition, and the nine-month water magic course, which is the first of its kind. She has over 10 years of water priestess experience and over 15 years of priestess and magical experience. We're going to get to know her more. I did want to mention also that she is an author, and I have today in the studio one of her books that I am reading right now. You can see this. It is called The Way of the Water Priestess, Entering the World of Water Magic, and I'm really enjoying it so far. It's got a lot of interesting and rich information. And then also, before we get started, I wanted to wish all of the Buddhists today uh, a happy Sagwa Dawa Dushin, which is Basically, a day that's very special because it commemorates the birth, enlightenment, and parinirvana of Buddha Shakyamuni. And so on today's today, if you do positive things, it's multiplied numerously, and the same with numer- uh, negative things. So this is a good time to do any kind of spiritual work, or also just charity work is fine as well. Um, and you'll have sort of the results of it will be exponential. Uh, and then before we get started, Michael has a few announcements. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our broadcast, and we're happy to have you guys all back with us. Um, and I'm excited about the show today. Of course, my background on my mother's side is all Celtic, so I can't wait to hear some of the Celtic stuff, hopefully. Um, we've got some great shows coming up, and next week we have Dan Moore back, and he's our a Kabbalistic scholar friend, and he'll be talking about the role evil plays in Kabbalah. Is evil really necessary, and how does it contribute to our spiritual growth, and so forth? So that should be fun. And then we'll be ending the month with our good friend and therapist, Merle Yost. So tune in for that. Get all the information on our website, sixcentsociety.com, S I X T H, all spelled out. And while you're there, if you can afford to, buy us a coffee on Ko fi. It really helps. But the biggest thing you can do is click like and subscribe on YouTube, and that really does a lot for us. So go ahead and do that, and we definitely appreciate it. Um, And I just wanted to announce, too, real quick, that we're going to be holding some tarot classes. We do this periodically, and it will be in the middle of July that we start. So great for beginners all the way through to people that are very advanced based on the Kabbalistic system we have for interpreting tarot. So if you guys are interested, just, you know, email us, go to the website, contact us, and we will uh, be happy to include you in that. Um, So I'm not going to take up any more time because I know we've got a lot to cover today. So with that, take it away, Krista. Great. Thank you, Michael. Just wanted to add that next week, uh, Wendy Allenby will be co-hosting with our show with Dan Moore. So we're looking forward to that. So welcome, Anwen. Hi, thank you so much for having me. You're most welcome. It's really great to meet you. And uh, to be honest, I, I don't know if I've ever met anyone who is so clearly connected to water in the way that you are. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it because I'm a water person. I'm a, my sign is a cancer and I have a lot of cancer in my astrological chart. Awesome. So I'm also a cancer. So that means that your birthday is soon or our birthdays are. Yes, <laughs> yes it is. I, I love the month of June because mine is the beginning of cancer. So I always feel like it's a a celebratory time, particularly as I've gotten older, I've just learned to uh, celebrate life. That's how I view my birthday. Yeah. Uh, So yeah, June is such a busy, busy, busy month for me because we've got uh, Father's Day, of course, my partner's birthday is early June. And then we've got the solstice, uh, which is always big. And then I end the month with my birthday. So I'm a June cancer as well. I've got a Pisces moon. Ah. Um, 
so lots of water in there and there's some other in my natal chart thankfully i have capricorn rising so <laughs> it gives me that grounded earth energy that i so desperately need it's like the container that then holds all of the water that is me um but it is interesting that the symbol for capricorn is a water goat yeah the sea goat my husband has like five planets. He's a Capricorn, has like five planets in Capricorn. <laughs> so. yeah, I, and I love it. I love it so much. I'm like, it. it's like the watery earth energy sign. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so my mother was actually an Aquarius. Oh. Um, so kind of like the water bearer. So yeah, it's, it's quite interesting how astrology uh, plays a part in some of the uh, the watery connections that I have. Although I will say it's not that way for everybody. Mm. You don't have to have astrological, you know, um, sit, uh, water in your astrological chart. You don't have to have it heavy in there to really work with water or be connected with water. Just in kind of the unraveling of like who I was and finding out who I am was very much this, oh, okay I can see water here 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 and so when they became part of this whole picture of the water connections that I had they they kind of became these important puzzle pieces that were like yes okay this was the path you were born to be on is the water path well and I I think you're absolutely right in all uh, cases that you don't have to be connected to water because you could also add it in because you lack water in, in terms I know someone that has no water in their chart and so that could be interesting for the person and in fact she did start I think she got a fountain and she started working with water deliberately so she could bring that more into her world and I thought that was really a, a great idea you know and but I could see that that there's something about um, if you have a strong element, you might be comfortable, like, you know, immersing yourself in that element. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I do actually, um, there's a lot of people that work with water that have fear around water as well, especially the deep ocean. Um, but I think that a lot of that deep ocean energy really connects us to the shadow and to the depth of both life and spirituality and those things can be scary um the unknown can be scary um but yeah yeah you definitely don't have to have astrology in your chart uh, sorry water in your astrology chart you don't have to have a deep connection with it you can even have a healthy fear of the ocean and still have a uh, a love for for water or to either it, to even incorporate it into our practice um it's if you look at ba- like paganism in general, Wicca in general, witchcraft in general, especially within the Celtic realms, um, we see these four elements over and over and over again, earth, air, fire, and water. So if you look at our pagan books and the books that are on the market, we have so many books on earth magic mm. um, through stones and herbs and um, just the natural world and then you take a look at deeper and we have you know books that talk about magical birds we have books that talk about how to make incense and use incense and all of this and scent and aromatherapy and all of these like very air type of magical processes and then of course we have so many candle magic books Mm. um there's so many so then i was kind of sitting around not really, but you know, looking <laughs> back at looking back in at at uh, the early early days, I remember um, this like thought of being like, "Wait, where's the water magic book? There's got to be one." And there was Sea Magic by Sandra Keynes, mm-hmm. um, and that was lovely, and it's um, a primer for many people still. And then slowly books, you know, there was a few more books that got released, but I, I knew that there was more Mm -hmm. than just, you know, working with the energies. I wanted to know if there was, and I knew there was, I wanted to prove it, I guess is a better way of saying that there was this historical, archaeological path of water that could be 
traced within the archaeological record that could be traced within history, mythology, folklore. And I knew, I knew it was there. And so I just started like digging in and researching. And when I first started on the on, on really researching and stuff, I had no idea what I was doing. I actually had to go back to university um, and get a degree in anthropology. I didn't have to get the degree in anthropology. I wanted to get the degree in anthropology because I didn't know how to research. I mm. didn't know how to really write. And if I was going to find the information, I was going to have to learn how to research. Mm. And of course, spirit puts amazing things in front of you. And all of a sudden I'm in an internship with this crazy man who's doing these like mapping of like ancient cities. And he's just really pressuring me to be in this internship. And I just, I finally conceded. And I was just like, fine, <laughs> like I will do this. I need the credit anyways. Well, it turned out that what he was doing was mapping where the wells were oh in wow cities because the well usually was where everything started mm. and then where everything built around so they would find where the wells were and then start mapping how far it was to the local temple how far it was to the local um farmer's market you know to where to buy your vegetables things like that and he was doing everything from ancient india into denmark um and so i i got to be in this internship and i learned how to speed read i learned how to sort through academic texts how to know what was a good text and a bad text mm. um because before that i had no idea and um of course at the time i was just like what am I, what is this? I don't even understand. But it was actually through that internship that I got to work with the PhD and the master's candidates. Um, and I worked alongside them. And I was actually doing the preliminary research in the books to then hand to them with mm. all the bookmarks of like, oh, read page 56, read page 427. So they would then take that information and input it into their studies. So I had no idea at the time that I was going to be an author, that I was going to write. In fact, my women's studies teacher had told me, I'll give you a, a letter of recommendation for anything but writing. <laughs> I, this is a true story. And I idolized her. I thought she was so amazing. Aww. And she basically was like, you stink. Uh, this is no good. Now, this is also the wisdom of the crone right? Mm. She wasn't wrong. Mm. Now she could have been perhaps, perhaps kinder, right? But if she had been kinder, then she may have said something like, Oh, this is great, but you can improve. And I would have heard that this is great, not the you can improve. So she really kind of gave it to me hard and basically was like, no. Nah, mm -mm. And that has kind of in like a subconscious way was like, well then watch me anyways, watch me do this. Right. That, that little rebellious mm. nature that I have right. that like, yeah, like, let me, let me show you that I will do it. So I got just obsessed and even deeper and just was diving into everything. And, um, I also went on a pilgrimage right before all of this started happening to Glastonbury. Now it was, not the first time I've been to the UK. Um, I'm actually a dual citizen, but this was the first time that I went to Glastonbury. I'm going to circle back to, to the university because this all kind of mixes together. Um, and uh, I, I went to Glastonbury for the first time. I was on sacred pilgrimage with my family, uh, my immediate family. And, um, you know, we we're out there and I, I wanted to go to Glastonbury. So the rest of the family went off on some tourist things and me and my partner went to Glastonbury for this, for the day. And I of course connected with the Chalice Well, which is such a beautiful and popular place, mm. of course. Um, but what was more impactful was across the street at the White Spring Temple, which is this amazing old Victorian well house that was a sandwich shop that is now converted into a pagan temple for both multiple, so for multiple goddesses and Gwenapneth and oh, and now um, they have a solar god 
the sun god shrine as well. So there's hmm. two masculine shrines and then there's three feminine shrines, Bridget, the Black Madonna, and the Fairy Queen, or Morgan Le Fay, I believe, is um, what the third one is. So this was really impactful, and I came away from that changed, completely changed. And I kept getting this, write a class about water, teach about water, teach about all the sacred water, teach about it. And so I started putting together an outline and this was right when I had entered into university. So these things were happening simultaneously. Mm. I didn't really put two and two together for a while. And so I'm learning how to write and I'm learning how to research and I'm in this crazy internship and I get, um, I, I submit a proposal and I teach at the, the Arizona Goddess Conference and I teach about water. It was my first class and some people loved it and some people were really confused and, um, it just kind of spiraled from there. The next thing you know, I'm teaching at Pagan Pride Day. I'm hosting rituals at Pagan Pride Day. Our coven did two water rituals in 14 and 15 um, at the Phoenix Pagan Pride. Um, and I launch my nine-month water magic course in 2015, which this is 22, so it's seven years old now, mm. which is Mm. kind of crazy <laughs> um uh, it feels just like yesterday and uh so that launched and i started teaching about water and then around 20 around that same time around 2016 2017 i was like you know there's got to be other people out there that are water priestesses or water witches or or are magical people connected with water there has to be and I started looking and I found Catherine Ravenwood and she wrote a book called um, how to make sacred water Hmm. and in this book the water basically spoke to her Hmm. as well and had said hey we want you to charm this water i'm paraphrasing here um you know basically charm the water and and create this sacred water to use in your rituals and i was like oh interesting because i'm kind of getting messages from the water too less about making sacred water and more about teaching people how to Mm. or to bring awareness to it so i reached out to her and i did an interview and it started um what i call a interview with a water priestess series Hmm. and Hmm. since then i have done i don't even know how many Hmm. um so like a dozen maybe um is this on your uh blog in your blog uh so they they are posted on my blog um on the patheos blog the water witch but i have an archive of them under waterpriestess.com Great. That's really helpful. You know, I, I wanted to mention at one point, uh, I'm, I'm going through probably the last decade, I would say, I'm still trying to establish exactly what I am, because I went from being, you know, I'm a Buddhist, I'm pretty sure about that. Then I got into witchcraft. And, uh, and then I realized I was a little mix of both. Then I realized I don't even know what I am. And maybe I don't have a label. But at one point, I did want to because I have a strong association with the ocean. And uh, my last name, Schwimmer. I mean, I have so many things with water, but uh, I I tried to do a quick, I mean, you know, maybe only a day or two. I was looking for anything historical around sea witches because I said there's got to be some archaeological evidence because of, you know, we we lived by the sea. There's got to be people that identify as a sea witch. I didn't even think about just water witches. I mean, that's what I like about your book is it, it it's so broad and, and makes you think about all the different ways you can connect to water, which are really different, but also similar, you know, but I wanted to ask you about that. Is there any, are there any cultures that have like a tradition that would call, you know, even they don't use the word sea witch, but that are, it's sort of more like, you know, kind of like the Strega witches, the Italian witches have that family. I said, there has to be something. <laughs> I mean, uh, but I, I didn't do a, a lot of investigation, but there was like literally nothing I could find. Well, and it's hard to find. So this is why it took me so long. So that that nine month water magic course, what happened is I ended up pitching it um, to a couple different publishers and it was Wiser that was interested 
Um, and my first book is actually called Water Witchcraft, and it focuses more on folk magic and witchcraft around water, where Water Priestess focuses a little bit more into a modern day perspective um, of sacred tending of the water. Mm. Um, and so there's a whole chapter on sea witches. Um and there's not a tradition like the generic witches or the um so in in italy the um this i'm not sure if they're officially strega but the, there's an italian witch sect um that call themselves um g- generic like jan like the goddess jana mm. um or janice and so they're these generic uh, it sounds weird because it yeah. sounds like I'm saying they're generic, right. but they're Jan, Eric, um, witches. And they would um, put some of these runes um, on seashells and cast them and stuff like that. And this is actually detailed in Raven Gramassi's work. So there isn't a tradition like that. However, there are absolutely sea witches um and magic surrounding the ocean um and some of these stories were um uh recorded in folklore um Mm. and so we have these folk stories of these witches um and some of those folk stories were here uh in the u.s Mm -hmm. so um there's one um that um an old folk story from massachusetts that clearly has some sort of european um uh, roots but um it talks about the sea witch that would walk the shores in her red heels huh. um and or her red boots you know because this was really scandalous um, so there was there was a little bit. And then in the Witchcraft Museum um, and um, in the folklore record um, or folk magic record, excuse me, folk magic record, there are two sea witches that um, are British or Brythonic, um, and they actually cast shells or bones um so one of them is the sea witch of miss giffy and if you ask me to spell that i am not going to be able to but it's in i believe it's in water witchcraft and so um one of them would cast their bones or their shells by taking a sawtooth fish which are now endangered and you can't do this but you may be able to find like a prehistoric one or or something mm. but they would take the snout of a sawtooth toothfish so that like very comb like and they would rake that into the sand to create lines Hmm. and then cast their sea bones or shells onto that to do divination the other one had a talking tambourine and i think that one is kate the gull no she might be a pirate oh i'm getting my names mixed up but okay so there's um there is uh, the talking tambourine. And so the talking tambourine was another sea witch and she would cast her shells um, in this. But what would she would do is think about a tambourine. And on one side, you've got the, the tight um, sinew or leather to, you know, actually. So there's two types of tambourines. Mm-hmm. There's a tambourine that's fully open. And then there's the tambourine that has like the drum face. Right. And so this is, so it's like the drum face with the leather um, or the sinew backing. So she took that and flipped it. So it kind of became a basket ah. and then um, had markings on the inside of the tambourine and would cast into that. Mm. So there's there's two divination methods that were recorded. Um, and then um, there's, oh, oh, can I think of another really good sea witch one? Um, am I going to blank at the moment? Ooh, I'm starting to blank. Those are the ones that come to mind at the moment. Mm, that's great. Um, I've, been, I've been heavily immersed in Sacred Springs this morning um, and doing <laughs> some research on them. So my, my seaside is blanking but um if you're interested definitely check out water witchcraft because that has got um the information on sea witches and it's got so much i mean celtic spirits that are associated with water Mm -hmm. mermaids and um different things like that oh there's the other one okay it's less about like a witch witch and more about a peller or a cunning man ah 
Yes. So this was another word for the um, the folk magic practitioner in that period where witchcraft wasn't really talked about. Christianity was really important. 18, 1900s, right in there. Um, maybe even as far back as the, the 1700s. But to be a cunning man or a power was a little bit different than to be labeled as a witch. Mm-hmm. But It was a folk magic practitioner. Um, So, you know, communion on Sundays and casting on Fridays. Um, And so he was walking on the shore. And so this old man at this point, he's an old man, just a regular old man walking on the shore. And the tide is out. So it's low tide. And he comes across a mermaid. And she is stranded on this rock um, at this low tide. And she can't get back out. So without really thinking about it, he just picks her up and carries her to the water and places her in. And this was a very selfless act. And so she rewards him. Mm. And I think this is very uh, true of water spirits in general is of course, if he had gone up to her and been like, Oh, Hey mermaid, I see you're trapped. Uh, If you give me some wishes, I'll take you to the water. Mm. She may have not been so kind. Right. Uh, This is why we have these negative stories a lot of times is because the abuse and the taking from not just the water itself, but from the spirits of the water. But he didn't do that. He just saved her with no question. And so she says to him, I will give you three wishes or gifts. What would you like? And so the first one um, was that he wanted to have the knowledge of herbs. Mm -hmm. Um, so he had the knowledge of herbs. She gave that to him. No problem. The next one was that he wanted to have the knowledge of healing. And so she grants this as well. And then the third is that he would then become a pallor or the cunning man. Mm. And she grants him this as well. So in this particular story, and there's another part to it, that's real important. I'll get to that. But in this particular story, it was the kindness and the selflessness, the service that he chose to give to her by carrying her out to the water, which is Mm -hmm. service. That is, that's a task, Mm -hmm. a selfless service. And he then is rewarded for it. He never asks. He's right. just rewarded. So in this case, his magical powers, his cunning man, or if you know, wise woman or witch powers come from the mermaid herself. So then the last thing is she then gives him another gift. She gifts him a comb, like a hair comb. Mm. And then she, this is the key part. She teaches him how to comb the waters in order to call her. So she not Mm. only gives him a physical gift uh, alongside those three spiritual gifts, but it's a way to communicate, to call her. Mm. So I sat with that for the longest time. And I was like, how would you call, like, how would that even work? Like, how would you call a mermaid with a comb? Well, first I spent tons of time, like having my mind blown about the fact that the image of the mermaid with the comb and the mirror. Right. Is not about vanity. It is not about beauty. It's we've had these things now, but the comb and the mirror are two completely different things. One is a portal. The other is to call from the portal. So this comb, I, I was like, how does this even work? Hmm. So I know about water and I know about vibration and I know that sound singing bowls, bells, um, just chanting all of these different things have a impact on the water there's a vibrational Mm. resonance that happens right so i'm like okay is that what is that what is happening with this comb the comb is in the water and then it's moving you comb the waters you move the comb through the waters which means the waters are being pushed through those teeth Mm -hmm. and making a, a noise Maybe it's not audible to us, but there is a vibration that happens then with the water being pushed through this. And so I was like, oh my gosh, a comb was never about the beautiful mermaid combing her hair. That reminds me of whales, the big whales mm. that when they go to eat. That, yes, that, yes. That's interesting. And of course, they're associated with sound and singing and mm-hmm. oh, that's and, fascinating. You know, I never. That's amazing, the comb idea. I've never heard anything like that 
Well, it's and it's in these because the the Celts were oral, the Druids didn't write anything down. We know that these things um we we have hints of what was happening. We have these hints through folklore, the stories that were passed down. So even though we don't have original text, we have these oral traditions. So yeah, so sitting there thinking about that, I was like, oh my gosh, the, that that comb is to summon her. There's sound resonance to summon the water spirits. And then when you take a look at mirror work, we, I mean, I probably don't have to lecture about that. I mean, we all know <laughs> that, that mirrors are portals that can be used as portals, that we, we use them to scry, we use them in so many different magical ways. We put people in mirrors, we make mirror boxes to protect our loved ones. We, you know, like we, we use mirrors a lot, even in Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. I love Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. Alice through the looking glass, the second book, Alice through the looking glass. What does she do? She actually uses a mirror, a looking glass to step into Wonderland. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we know that Alice in Wonderland is just full of so many esoteric principles and occult imagery. And um, I mean, Lewis Carroll, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm, I'm, wasn't he in one of the magical lodges, Golden Dawn? Or I think he was, but I'm not a hundred percent sure either, but I think you're yeah, right. I, I feel like I've heard it before, but. I, I cannot remember if it's a fact, but either way, he, I mean, he had to have been bit just based off of what we know now and looking at these images and the imagery within it. Um, and we see that even parallel within Celtic magic and Avalonian magic, painting the roses red, the, the red queen and the white queen. Mm -hmm. See that in, in the Celtic colors of even in the War of the Roses, the red and the white, the dragons within the land, the red dragon of Wales, the white dragon. Um, and then within Glastonbury, we see that again, the red spring and the white spring. So within Alice in Wonderland, I mean, this, these, these ideas, these, these concepts are, are woven throughout the story. So to see in the second book for her to step through this, mirror is this perfect visual visual of us to really understand how potent mirrors can be in magical work it can be doors to other worlds mm -hmm. and so when you look at the mermaid and the pictures that we see of her holding a mirror and a comb we automatically think oh yes seduction and beauty and and vanity and all of these things which i think are probably part of it but i wager that the original um concepts were spirit summoning and portal moving moving within and mm -hmm. out of portals it's interesting too because i i mean maybe when i was younger i and maybe coming back now i was more into the concept of the mermaid but i think it's been distorted enough for me through uh i guess you'd say movies that she's been almost over sexualized uh to the point where it's it's only, you know, it's just not a full representation, I think, of someone that would be like a, a real archetypal mermaid, even though, like I said, I kind of come back to it a little bit more trying to find like the real folklore around the mermaid. And uh, I'm sure that it's quite different, some of the stories and what we think. It, it really is. And when you go back into the old stuff, and you read about it and you look at the old things you're like no there's there's more here i mean we get this idea of the seductress mermaid from the odyssey from um when odysseus um runs into the sirens but what's so interesting about that is at this particular point when that story was written sirens didn't have tails they were not mermaids it isn't until about the 1500s when we start seeing sirens and mermaids moving into one mm. and i've thought about this a really long time as well and i've got a, a few thoughts and and based on research and contemplation so i do think that they're different that they're very different but i believe that it was during the period of the alchemical manuscripts, when we start seeing the mermaid with angelic wings or angel wings. And I think that this is where the tail gets swapped in for the feet. 
the mm-hmm. little bird feet because mm-hmm. originally they would have had these wings and, and bird feet but the, we start seeing then okay maybe there's a connection instead of the winged feminine with the bird feet we see this winged feminine with a mermaid's tail um and i think that they were separate mm. but it was quite easy to just swap the feet um and start talking about them as sirens and then give them this seductive seductive type nature and there are stories there's a story about an old sea captain who captures a mermaid at sea brings her back to his estate hides her in his local his pond on his property and um she's there until he dies Mm. in which case she's forgotten and is just stuck in this pond and becomes very aggressive and very mean and then now takes on this nature of aggressor Mm. so then the the story picks up where she then is this beautiful maiden in the lake or the pond and so when young men walk by she lures them in oh did you see all of the treasure that i have down here you you have got to see this treasure it's Mm. it's here they're like oh yes okay let's see and they start wading into the water up to their waist and they're done but but this goes back to what i was talking about before with the way that we interact with the water and the water spirits the way that we treat them informs how they interact with us um so after she was forgotten she then takes on this more aggressive nature and kind of becomes the villain of the story. But was she really a villain in the first place? I don't know. You know, it mm. sounds to me like she was a kidnap victim that then got forgotten. Right. No, so it's, it's, it's definitely a more complicated story then. Isn't that, yeah. I think that's also true about, I was reading something about Medusa. I know this is off topic a little bit. I think that, that she was raped. There was something I was going to look into the whole Medusa story. And she's sort of being reclaimed a little bit too, in terms of was she really just a, an evil figure. Uh, uh, but I did want to get into before um, we go on some of the idea of working with other kinds of water, which makes your you very unique, I found like, for instance, I, I watched your YouTube video about collecting dew, and I thought that was really cool. And that idea of working with any kind of water. And uh, how would you uh, encourage people to find like the, the right type of water to work with what would be some of the ways they could identify that if they were confused because some people probably wouldn't be confused yeah oh that's a great question um so i actually started um using the term water witch when i was living in arizona because i was no longer near the ocean and so i didn't feel like i could really identify as a sea witch um i had for a long time i lived you know off the coast of japan off the coast of north carolina florida all that stuff and now i found myself in in the desert um and this is when the springs really started to speak to me and so i started to be like wait a second like what happens if you are deeply connected with the water and you live on the top of a mountain and you have never been to the beach you can't call yourself a sea witch that doesn't make any sense um so i started using water and i got a lot of pushback not people didn't like it at first they were like just call yourself a sea witch um they didn't they didn't like change but i was like really like there are people that have deep connections to the river and the water in the river is so different than the water in the ocean. Mm. And the same thing with the water in a sacred spring or rain or a creek or snow or, or anything. What about tap water? You know, like you could use anything and there's a, a wide variety. So for me, I looked back and I looked at my own personal memories. And I, like I said, I grew up in Florida. So I had access to both the beach and the sacred springs. But in my memory, the most impactful places, the places that I remembered the most, where I remember talking to the water, of course, talking to water spirits at the time, I had no idea, um, you know, were at sacred springs. And so there was this idea of this, this these smaller bodies of fresh water just sung to me it just there was something about it that just made everything in me just vibrate like the water was singing and the ocean is lovely and I love it and it's beautiful beautiful place but it it doesn't do the same as 
that fresh water. So I encourage uh, everybody to go out to their local body of water and see how you feel there. And then compare that to other local or other bodies of water that you've visited over time and in the past and see like, do I always find myself at the ocean? When I have the choice to drive an hour to a waterfall or an hour to the ocean, which one do I pick? And kind of allowing your heart to to call you. Now, there's some people that I know um, and other water priestesses that work with all types of water um, equally. Mm. And then there's some that are more sea priestesses. Um, so getting to know water um, and water priestess, the book Water Priestess is a great book for this. Um, but also Water Witchcraft has a section, um, a, a chapter on this. And it's getting to know your local body of water of really getting out from behind the computer, out from behind, you know, out of your house and into the local environment and experiencing these places for yourself. And if if you're in Arizona or Utah or any of these places and you're listening right now and you're thinking, well, I don't have any water here, you absolutely do. I thought that exact same thing when I moved to Arizona. I even had a little bit of a dramatic like, oh, no, I'm away from water. What am I going to do? And the water showed me that even in the driest places, it is there. Um, In Arizona, there are man-made canals and there are man-made lakes. But just on the outskirts of Phoenix, um, there is Tonopah Hot Springs. About an hour and a half north towards Sedona, there is um, a sacred spring. There are springs in Sedona. There's rivers in Sedona. So just right outside those desert locations into the mountains, um, which a lot of deserty areas are surrounded by that, um, the water is there. Um, And if you are still not able to find it, there's a great website. It is... It's either springfinder.com or find a spring. I think it's findaspring.com. And this is wonderful. It's actually run by um, a dear friend of mine's uh, partner. Um, and they're they're called Alive Water. And um, they they maintain this site so that people can not only collect fresh drinking water, um, which that's what I'm drinking right now for those of you all that can see the video. My little copper vessel here is actually collected or is, is full of fresh, raw spring water that my partner collected for us yesterday. Um, so I, you know, we drive an hour just to get our, our water for the week. And um, so so there's ways to connect with local springs. If, if you uh, have never visited one before, check that out and see, do a meditation. Do a meditation there. Then go to a river do a meditation there, go to the ocean, do a meditation there, and then wait till it rains. Mm. And then do a meditation there and see which one really sings to you, which makes you want to set up an altar, want to go back, that makes you want to figure out, oh, what spirits dwell within this body of water? Those things that are really exciting, that, that kind of like, ignite that passion around water is what you should just listen listening to your own water in your own body because it's not going to lie to you you will feel it and and you'll know um there's um there's books full books about about this i think is one of them called the blue mind um where it talks about just being near the ocean actually makes us feel different Mm -hmm. and better and if you really are landlocked and you you know don't have the ability to get to the river the ocean or any of these places then tap water your bath water all of these things are also great ways to work with water and to get to know water better um my first book water witchcraft has a bunch of exercises for grounding and shielding using water One of them is an actual grounding exercise that you do in the bathtub. And then when you're finished, you pull the plug Mm. of the bath and you stay in the bath and you let the water drain. And you, with that, you push out all of that negative 
funky energy that you don't want. Um, so even just working with your bathtub um, can be quite powerful. Ritual bathing, sacred bathing, um, magical bathing. So there's three different kinds of, of these bathings. I've split them into different categories. I have a blog about this um, on my blog somewhere if you guys are interested. But it talks about like the, the spiritual baths, you know, the ones where it might be cold water and you might be in coffee or, mm. you know, a bucket full of like mashed up green herbs and it is not pretty. It might smell a little bit, but you are going to get a massive spiritual cleansing or reset. And then we see these beautiful Instagram baths, right? Which can be very, very powerful. There is something about doing magic within that cocoon of the womb mm. of that liquid um, mother kind of holding you that is, is very, very powerful. And I know that it can be tough to see these beautiful pictures on Instagram and think, well, I can't have those flowers. I don't have those candles. It's not about that. It's about the ritual act of getting into that water, of doing the magic in the water with what you have, mm -hmm. with your basic crystals. Um, taking your quartz crystal, put it in your bathtub, charge the water, stirring it like you're stirring a cauldron and really charging that water with something, prosperity, magic, um, love magic, uh, protection even, you know, and, and however, whatever your intent is, and really charging that water and setting the space before you get in. Uh, and then there's just like quick little magical baths too, that um, might be a couple of drops of essential oils and a rose quartz um, to bring in love. You know, it, it brings those magical tools in, but it's, it's quick and it's not this big candlelit ritual bath. Um, so even stuff like that is, is quite potent. Um, and then there's basic just working with what I call potions um, or elixirs, and that is using water as a base for a spray or for a magical um, type of uh, water blend. I think a, a really good, two really good examples that we all know are war water and Florida water, um, where it contains other ingredients, um, whether that's, you know, essential oils um, to create a beautiful scent or rusty iron nails to create a more malefic or powerful intent. Um, this idea that water absorbs and water holds within it the signature, the energetic signature of what is put in it. It also then amplifies it. Mm -hmm. This goes all the way back to Leland. Charles Godfrey Leland actually wrote about this in um, Sorcery and Fortune Telling. Mm. Um, and he talks about this idea of taking saffron and putting saffron into the water and then the water then absorbing and enhancing the properties of that saffron so that it could be used as an eye wash. And so when I read that, I was like, they knew this. Mm -hmm. They knew this it, like 200 years ago. Then they probably knew this 200 years before that and even before that. Um, you know, where this idea that water absorbs and enhances. Mm -hmm. um, so just knowing those things um, can help you. You can make a quartz crystal water spray just to, you know, keep in your purse, just, and you know, spray yourself down a little bit every day. Um, the other thing that uh, is quite simple that I think we forget about a lot is tea mm. and tea magic. Yes. Um, so a lot of, um, there's a lot of emphasis on fresh spring water and um, all this kind of stuff within the water communities, mostly because it's our drinking water and it's so precious, but we forget that water has other forms. It's not just cold, we can heat it and we can use it for ritual bathing hot. We can use it for tea. What are we doing? We're extracting the plant, the properties of the plant, the spirit of the plant into the water to then intake it. Why don't we just munch on the herbs? Because putting it into that warm water, it is, it becomes these little magical rituals. The water is, is taking that 
the plant spirit out, the plant, you know, properties out, and then you put it into your body. Um, and divination around water has, again, that's another one that's, oh, lots of, um, we could do just an entire hour. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, Nostradamus used a bowl yep. under his well, bed. Yeah, tea leaf reading. Yeah, tea leaf. You know, that's really popular on the East Coast for some reason, not as much on the West Coast as the East Coast. At least it was when I was younger. And of course, the you have coffee grinds and things like that from the Middle East. Yep. But but yeah, it is amazing when you think about um, how much you can focus on water. But also, in a way, it shouldn't be amazing because we're really a water planet. Well, and we're not only are we a water planet where, I mean, most of the surface is water, but our bodies are little miniature planets of water. It's just all on the inside. So scientifically, we're somewhere between 60 to 80 percent water. But on a actual molecular level, we're 99 percent, which basically means hmm. we are water. We are sacred vessels. Um, it's it's kind of mind blowing when you think, wow, we really have that much water within us. Um, but it makes sense that we live on a water planet and that we have to drink water and we, we have to have this constant flow of nature through us. Um, and then I, I wanted to quickly get into that um, because you mentioned this in, in your book and also I think on your website, the idea that you can sort of be part of water in different ways. But the part I wanted to ask you about is how you're feeling with regards to the more noticeable attention on the water protectors of the indigenous world that have been coming out because of activism and have, in a good way, they're shaping our views of water. And is this not then a pivotal moment in our world for all of us in some way to pay more attention to people like that and and yourself that have been working with water because it seems like we have all kinds of water issues. Oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, it was Standing Rock that really kind of awakened my water activism. At the time my son was um, younger, I think he was in elementary at the time, and I there's just everything in me wanted to go. I wanted to leave everything, go and protect the water protectors. Um, and I couldn't. Uh, it just it wasn't something that was available to me. And uh, I was frustrated with it. And so I started doing protection magic for the water protectors because I wanted to do something. Mm. And that was the vehicle, the, the avenue in which I could help out with the means that I had. And that started to lead me into other things like working binding spells for companies that are destroying our water and protection spells for the dolphins when the dolphin slaughter is happening in Japan and the protection for the water protectors and justice for the water protectors and justice for water. Um, and one of the reasons why I, one of the many, many reasons why I, brought water priestess to life was not just about my path as a water priestess, not just about um, the interview series of finding other women out there that, that were also water, rot, watery people and men too. Um, but about finding a way that we could walk beside our indigenous brothers and sisters because part of me was like okay fine i'm just gonna go be a water walker i'm gonna start my own water walk and i had to really sit with that and be like whoa wait a second whoa whoa that is something that indigenous elders are doing and not something for me to go and be the star of and not that i'm trying to be the star of anything but you know what i'm talking about sure. with i don't need to place myself in front of them i need to like give them a voice or figure out how I can do similar work um, alongside them and support them without taking from what they're doing. And that's kind of where Water Priestess um, came about was this idea that we are sacred people too. 
and we have to start sacred tending the water. We cannot leave it up to our indigenous brothers and sisters to do all of the work. That's absolutely ridiculous. We all drink water. We all live on this planet. And they are some of the most disadvantaged and marginalized groups. And they're out there fearlessly, Mm -hmm. fearlessly fighting for the future of our water, which means they're fearlessly fighting for the future of our children not just theirs, but ours and our children's children. And we have to also take up that mantle of sacred water tending and say, hey, we're going to do something about this too. And we're going to do it in our pagan way. And we're going to try and bring awareness and support um, to these other groups, especially those indigenous groups. And so I have a ton of students that enter into my courses through the water witchcraft or water priestess that somehow end up either on beach cleanups, river cleanups, in activism, um, all sorts of stuff. And um, I think it's vital that we all become aware and that we hold hands with the other people that are doing this work and say, Hey, I've got you. My magic is going to support your magic. And together we are going to make a change and we're going to do it in a way where everybody's voice is heard, not just mine, just because I happen to be a little bit loud and a lot extra. Um, (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, we really have to support that um, because it's a collective problem. It's not going away. And if we can really shift our framework as a collective to understanding that water is sacred and must be treated as so, we can make a change and we won't have to worry about water for our great grandchildren. Um, We can be in a place where maybe they can grow up in a world where that water is protected and sacred. Mm. And maybe that's a dream, but I'm going to keep working on it. It's a, it's a great dream. And there are definitely people interested in, in going after that dream together on different levels from scientists to mystics, to indigenous people um, I've seen that when people have come together about a water problem in their community, there's a large representation of all kinds of people. Now, I did want to give a shout out before we're, we only have about three more minutes. How can people reach you? What's the best? I know you have several websites. So what's the best maybe starting place to find out what you do and your classes and you do readings too? Yes. So actually the main platform that I'm on is Instagram. You'll find me on Facebook and on Twitter, but I don't use it as much. Um, it's just Anlin Avalon. Make sure you've spelled it right. I have like six fake uh, scam accounts after me right now, like with a double L and an underscore. Um, but yeah, so Anlin Avalon on Instagram. And I have also recently started a portfolio website. It's not finished, but it's AnlinAvalon.com. Mm-hmm. And that will take you to everything. If you want a link to the books, a water priestess, water witchcraft, Avalonian magic, art, dance, all of those things are on there. So you can kind of explore the whole, um, the whole thing. And you can get from to my blog from there. Um, but then just for ease, I also have water witchcraft and water priestess.com. That's wonderful. Uh, any quick last thought? We have like another couple minutes that you'd like to leave our guest with our audience with. Oh, Remember that you're water um, and that you are a vessel of water and that you're so powerful. Don't shrink yourself. Don't shrink your waters or, or let your waters be stagnant. Um, There's, uh, there's so much magic in the world. And uh, I think that now is such a wonderful time for people to explore it and to really find out what their path is Um, and follow your heart. Listen to the waters in your body because they won't lead you astray and follow your heart because anything else is going to leave you unhappy. I love that. Listening to your heart and the water in your body. That's the first time I've really heard that. Well, thank you so much for coming on. We could definitely have you back again. That was, I learned so much. It was so interesting and you have so much more to share. So hopefully we'll have you back at another time. 
I love that. Thank you. So uh, make sure to check out her Instagram. Uh, by the way, I did have someone trying to a fake account trying to reach out and say, you know, I think you need a reading under your name, by the way, that's the first time that happened to me. So <laughs> I thought I've luckily have recognized it. But thank you all for listening in. Join us next time as we continue to explore the esoteric and the obscure together. Have a wonderful week and get out and learn about your local water places.